All right, so this morning then we're picking up with chapter 4 of First Thessalonians. Before we get into chapter 4, just a quick reminder of what we covered in chapter 3. Paul is encouraged by the Thessalonians and their steadfastness in the calling that God had given them. Paul had passed through this era, if you remember some of the history, and he was forced to leave with the Jews stirring up trouble. Um, and this is the, uh, the whole aspect of the first missionary trip he had. He went on from there to um, Athens and then from there to Corinth. And Corinth is generally accepted as where he was when he wrote this first epistle. Um, and so he had left Timothy behind when he left Thessalonica to pastor the area to help those individuals. And so Timothy sends a very encouraging report that Paul highlights in chapter 3. So then moving on to chapter 4, uh, verse 1, Paul then here says, Furthermore, when we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. And if you remember from the last study that we went through, this expression here, abound more and more, has to do with what we would say in the English, super abounding, abounding beyond abundance, that it would be overflowing. Verse two then, for you knew, no, excuse me, what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And the word there, commandments, simply means charges or instruction that Paul taught them as he was taught. And this is, uh, even within mainstream Christianity, still Oh, I, point of contention is too strong a comment, though. Um, there are many that believe that Paul's writings supersede the instruction Christ gave or what was given in the Old Testament. That's certainly not the case. Paul even refutes that with his own language, but that's generally not paid attention to. That's called Pauline theology as opposed to Christology. And so this is not that he's giving them different commandments than what Christ gave them. Uh, even as the one that spoke to Israel in the Old Testament. It's simply instruction here. Um, what's interesting is that this is generally agreed upon that this was the first epistle recorded, preserved by Paul. Not the first book of the New Testament. It's generally accepted that was Mark's gospel account. But nonetheless, there would have only been a handful of letters that we would recognize as now books of the New Testament. And Paul's teaching them from the Old Testament and from his instruction directly from Jesus Christ. So then verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And sanctification simply means holiness, that as we are called and given God's Holy Spirit, it should lead us to holiness in him. And being Thessalonians, they were originally part of the Greek Empire. They're now part of the Roman Empire. The gods' names changed. The emperors changed, but pretty much nothing else did. And under that pagan system of worship and extension throughout the culture, it was very licentious, um, sexually amoral. And so this is one of the things that Paul is instructing them on. To abstain from that lifestyle. And I have a note there for 1 Corinthians 7 2, and I'll just read that to you. He says to the Corinthian audience as well, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. That for a time, even in this country coming out of Victorian England, uh, there was a sense that the, the sexual union in a marriage was inappropriate to talk about and was not really even acknowledged. That's not the relationship God designed in the marriage. He designed that sexual union to bind those people together um, and he designed it to procreate. And that's Malachi, that he desires holy seed. And through us then he grows his family. So it's not a matter of sex being wrong, it's sex outside of marriage. And we have diluted that even in our modern culture, that if you say that um, you're a virgin and saving yourself for marriage, in most circles, you would be ridiculed for that. Prudish is being old fashioned. Uh, but 
What's not talked about in the culture around us is the damage that's done when people practice that, engage in that behavior on a regular basis outside of marriage. It's very damaging emotionally, mostly to women, but even to men, more so than it's talked about. And so then verse four, he says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That is, that, that sexual union is to be done the way God ordained. Verse five, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. That's not the pattern of behavior that we are to follow and emulate. Verse six, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. The other thing that's not talked about in the culture, especially around us in terms of what's called free sex, is that it's not free. Someone is being defrauded somewhere along the line. And what I mean by that is it's essentially stealing, taking something that's not yours. God gives us a helper in the marriage union. The husband and the wife are to serve each other and to help each other and to become one together. When you take of that sexual union outside of marriage, you've taken now something that that person that marries someone else can never give to that person. Um, and again, it also takes this emotional toll that we don't talk about very often. There is a growing body out there within the psychological community that acknowledges this, but it's not generally talked about because of the implications that it would require in changing behavior. And so verse seven, for God has not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. And so then Romans six, verse eight there says, now if we died to Christ, we believe that we should also live in him. This is the holiness that we're to emulate. Our life upon baptism, accepting God's Holy Spirit is no longer our life. And again, that sounds very foreign, especially to our Western year, that we would be essentially a slave, as Paul talks about in other areas. But we are called to holiness, which means we need to emulate Christ. Um, and there's even heresies out there that he actually married. This is the whole Dan Brown book series with, um, oh, now I forget the title of it, but that was a popular movie some years back, uh, that there's this whole family line that went through Jesus Christ, that he married Mary, uh, married Mary Magdalene and so forth. It wasn't that Christ was opposed to marriage. He didn't come to have a family. He came to die for us. But his holiness is what we're to emulate above everything else. Verse 8, he therefore that despises, despises not man but God, meaning in, in this consideration of a life pleasing to God, but specifically in how we behave sexually, in the marriage, outside of the marriage, if we despise that, we're not despising man, we're despising what God has ordained. We even say that in our marriage ceremony, what God has ordained, let not man uh, pull apart. So despises not man, verse eight, but God who has given us to his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write to you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And this goes back to chapter 3 and verse 12 here, and I'll just scroll up so you can see that. May the Lord make you to increase and superabound in love towards one another and towards all men, even as we do towards you. And so in verse 9, what he's talking about here is this superabundance, sorry, skip forward on me, this superabundance of love. John talks about that extensively in his letters that will be recorded later on. Um, this love is a godly love, not an emotional, physical love that ends up being selfish. Um, maybe not overtly, but fundamentally is. God's love is different in that it's sacrificial, it's serving, it's outgoing, um, puts the needs of others before us. Um, so he says, I don't need to write to you about that because he's already talked to them about it. And this has been part of their understanding that they've been given. So then verse 10, and indeed you do it towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia, but we beseech you brethren that you increase more and more. So this has been their example. And this 
quite frankly, is the example of God's people down through time. But before I get to that, let me back up to this part here where he's highlighting Macedonia. Now, in this area, Thessalonica was on the coast. And so if you look at the top of the Aegean Sea, Thessalonica is up there. The Romans expanded the harbor and made it a very good deep water port, but it became a stepping off point to go to the interior of what used to be called Greece. It's also called Macedonia. And so just by their example, they were essentially preaching the word of God. They're the difference of how they behaved, even publicly, how they engaged in, in interacted with people in business or whatever it happened to be. It, he says that this love was expressed towards all the brethren. Now, other churches, certainly. But then as the world looks at us, they saw this as well. And so he's encouraging them to do this more and more because there's no limit to living in God's way of life. The good aspects of what God is teaching us, he is about, that we can never do too much of that. There's, as Paul later says, there's no law against those things. So verse 11, and that you study to be quiet and do your own business to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you don't meddle or gossip and uh, go on about other people's business. It's not that you're not involved in their lives, but it's not up to me to tell somebody what job to have, um, what their hobby should be. If they're not asking my opinion to insert myself in their life, um, because we've got enough, quite honestly, to deal with on our own, don't we? And so he says you know, to be quiet in that way, to, to not be meddling. Um, verse 12 then, that you may walk honestly towards those that are without, those outside of the church, the ecclesia, those that God has called, that you may have lack of nothing, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. So once again, towards the end of this chapter, and this is a theme that Paul repeats throughout this letter, he speaks to the return of Jesus Christ, and the inference is that he still expected that that would be soon, as the other apostles did, and quite frankly, the whole church. They didn't understand fully at this point that Christ was not going to return probably in their lifetime as they saw it. And so in the later letters from Paul, you'll see that shift in understanding. But nonetheless, the reality that we understand what Christ's first coming accomplished, as he says there in verse 13, that we understand now the resurrections. The, the world doesn't have that hope. You and I have the understanding of those great questions of life. Um, what is the meaning of life? You know, why do I exist? What happens after death? And we then understand this, this life is temporary. However long that happens to be, it's not permanent, it's not forever. We do die eventually. But that in that death, there is no agony. There is no hell fire as was brought into Christianity from the pagan teachings. And that there is an understanding as well that God will work with those who have not had the opportunity to understand his way of life in this lifetime. That's infinitely merciful, better than anything else man has dreamed up. And so he says, we have that hope. They don't. For verse 14, excuse me, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, those also who sleep in Jesus will bring God, God will bring with him, meaning the return of Christ. So if we truly believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we also understand what death is at this point. And, and Paul uses the expression sleep here. And I have a note there from Psalm 6, and I'll just read that to you. Psalm 6, verse 5 uh, David here simply writes, I'm weary with my groaning all night in my bed. I make my bed to swim. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a verse ahead, verse five. For in death, there is no remembrance of you in the grave who will give you thanks. It's like going to sleep and being completely unaware of the time that passes. In verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 17, verse 15 of Psalms, uh, chapter 17, verse 15 
David again writes, he says, For as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I wake in your likeness. Uh, David had an understanding that he would be resurrected and be like God in terms of spirit. And so we find this, Job talks about this there. Paul talks about it more later on. The death is likened as a sleep. And so the next waking moment, literally, for those people that have gone to the grave, it will be as if no time passed at all, whether it's a couple of days, a couple of years, a hundred years, thousands of years, it doesn't matter. Um, we know that God will resurrect them. And especially the saints, as Paul writes here, God will bring with him, with Christ. Verse 15 then, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remaining until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent those who are asleep. And again, the English is a little archaic there, but what Paul is talking about is that when Christ returns, the order of resurrection is first those in the grave, those saints that Christ will resurrect, and those who are alive at his second coming will follow them. We won't precede them. We won't prevent them from being first, um, but that we will also be resurrected. So it's not like there's a long time period. It's just like being in a line. You have someone that's first and someone that's second and so forth. And this is the way God is going to do it. Um, and I see a fairness in that. They've gone before us. They've waited longer, uh, even if they don't realize it. And so then we know from 1 Corinthians 15, as it says in verse 52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the day, dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. We know that corruptible means the physical flesh will be changed from physical to spirit, as Paul even has already highlighted. We will be like God. And so this is chapter four. So again, feel free to jump in if you have any questions. Feel free to highlight that. I'm, I'm sorry, there were a couple of verses left here yet. So chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself, this is the order of the resurrection, this is the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And I've already read 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Uh, Matthew 24 talks about this as well, where Christ um, tells... Uh, the disciples there about the end time event and some of the things that will transpire. You can look that up later if you're inclined. But we also know from this expression here, the dead in Christ shall rise first. If you have the first of something, there's at least a second of something. Otherwise, you don't need to, to use that language. If it's all at once, it just you would say that. You wouldn't say there's a first and then this and after that something else. Uh, we know from Scripture there's going to be three resurrections, and it's not my point of this Bible study to get into that. But the first resurrection are for the saints, those called, those who lived this way of life that God has um, already seen, if you will, that will be in his family. Those are the ones that will be resurrected at Christ's return. Second resurrection we picture in the last great day, holy day, that's the overwhelming majority of mankind have lived and died never knowing God's way of life and what the choice is they should make between that those two trees all going all the way back to the garden. The way of give, the way of get, the way of life, the way of death, uh, way of God, the way of Satan. They'll understand that. And then those incorrigible uh, will be in the third resurrection. But again, we could cover that in a different Bible study. So verse 17 then, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And there are some then that teach from this, a theology that we will be in heaven on clouds playing harps. And I'm not deriding that, I'm just saying that's the teaching. But we know that's not the case. Uh, Christ is not going to be in the clouds forever. And so wherever he is, we will be, um, but we know it's not in the clouds forever because it talks about him reigning on earth, talks about the saints reigning with him, talks about him standing on Mount Olives there in the prophecies. And you can look up those verses I have there, but there are many, many others that talk about that. 
it is as Christ is returning, the saints that have died will be resurrected first. And as they meet Christ, those who are alive will meet him as well behind them. That's what this verse is talking about, verse 17. And so then he says in verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. And this is the hope that goes back to verse 13. You know, life is hard, isn't it? It's some, sometimes it's, it's extremely hard. And for us to then not be consumed in the moments of those trials, not that they're not important, not that they don't have an impact, they do. We're to learn and grow from them and through them, but to not let that get us off point. That is the vision of what God is accomplishing through us, in us, all of his people, and what we can be a part of in the future. Um, years ago, I read an article, I wished I had kept it, but it was a study done on prisoner of war uh, victims, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War. And it became for a time a sort of subset of some psychological circles because there were different ones that were intrigued with how that impacted different people because they acknowledged they could see the damage of some of these prisoners of war as they would return home after the war. Some of them would be so broken they couldn't function in society anymore. And some of them, it was as if being a prisoner of war never happened. And so, as I said, it was very intriguing to some people. They began to study some of this. And the long and short of it came down to a really simple matter. Those that ended up surviving intact, if you will, mentally, emotionally, physically, for the most part, through those prisoner of war experiences, all had something to live for. They had a goal they wanted to accomplish. I remember reading part of the story was this fellow wanted to build a house, and so he designed this whole house in his head. He didn't have paper, he didn't have pencil, he'd mark it out in the dirt on the floor. Of course, that would get destroyed all the time, but he went through this enough times he had literally a picture in his mind of how he's going to build this house that was the reason he wanted to get home other people can have family spouses other things they want to accomplish but those that broke in some form or fashion and remained broken after these experiences didn't have those visions didn't have that hope of something in the future and so it was only a matter of now and surviving and unfortunately, human nature will do some very ugly things if they're only thinking of themselves, especially in those situations. And so Paul is reminding here through the end of chapter four about the return of Jesus Christ, the resurrections and the hope that we have. So even if he may have not been correct in terms of his understanding of when Christ would return, it doesn't negate the fact that Christ will return and the hope that we still have in all of that. And so then we come to chapter five, last chapter of this letter. So he starts out saying, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. Now he's continuing the thought here. These chapter breaks were made by men later on. And so just read chapter four into chapter five as if there's no break in thought. He says, I don't need to write to you about the timing of all of that. For you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night meaning that it will come unexpectedly that we, if, even if we were, and we are, we're given a time frame in terms of what will happen, aren't we, in Scripture. We know there's going to be this major political and religious power in Europe. We know the powers of the East, probably Russia, China, other nations allied with them, they're going to push at this kingdom. They're going to fail. We also know that Israel as a whole is going to go into captivity. We know these broad brush, brush stroke things, but in terms of when that will happen, we don't know, do we? I mean, God could accelerate things. It could all be done in a year or less. Or as it's been, he could have fits and starts. And we see things that might be the undoing, you know, World War I, World War II, dropping of the atomic bomb there in Japan, or a lot of people were convinced Going back to the mid-1800s, William Miller and the Millerites thought for sure they had it figured out when Christ was returning. And so many people then say, well, if, if there's no way of knowing, then it must not be true. Well, that's just as bad a position to take. And so they'll be unprepared. And of course, a thief comes when you don't expect him. That's the whole job of a thief, isn't it? 
when you're there, when you can defend yourself or when you can drive him away, that's not the time he wants to come. And so as it is with Christ returning, the day of the Lord there is the expression in scripture talks about one of two things. It is the year preceding Christ's return or it is the day of his return, the, time, the actual timing. And so when Christ returns, it will catch people off guard. Verse three then, for when they say, when they shall say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them. And we hear this all the time, don't we? That life will go on. This is the way things have always been. And we'll get past this. And we hear then similar expressions, peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. You know, once the woman is pregnant, you have to deliver the baby one way or the other. There's no getting around it. And mankind has sown the seeds, if you will, of their actions, and it will come due. And Christ will not stop his plan. God will not stop his plan of salvation uh, because mankind doesn't believe it. It will still be accomplished. Verse 4, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. Now, there was a subset of Greek philosophy called Gnosticism. And in the Gnostic teachings, there are different variations of this, but it all came from pagan philosophy. And one of the things in pagan philosophy was that you would contrast things like darkness with light. Darkness was evil, light was pure and good. Physical was corrupt, spirit was uncorruptible. So you had these contrasts. John uses those contrasts regularly, but Paul does as well here. So when he's saying darkness, you are not in darkness. That means you are not uninformed. You're not unaware. You're not without knowledge. You know this. Well, in darkness, you don't know things, do you? You can't see. Light is gone. You may have a general understanding, but you're still in the middle of the night walking timidly so you don't find the corner of that table with your toes. Um, darkness hides things. So he says, you're not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Going back up to verse two, the day of the Lord. We're not ignorant. We should have a pretty good understanding of as things shape up in the world around us, how that factors into the return of Christ. So he says, by way of contrast in verse five, excuse me, verse five, you are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And so you have these verses here. So let me just read a couple of them. Ephesians 5 and verse 8, it says, For you were once in darkness. This is a Paul, again, writing to the church at Ephesus. You were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, meaning in God. That we have light that illuminates our path. Light that helps us to see what we're to be doing. Light that exposes things. So we're not caught unaware here. Romans 13 and verse 12. Romans 13, verse 12, Paul writes, he says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I find it interesting as well that as you read the end of the book of Revelation, it talks about the Father coming down bringing his throne down to this earth, there'll be no more need for the sun and the moon, that his very existence is literally light giving. Um, this is what Paul's tapping into here, some of this imagery, if you will, in reality. So then verse six, he says, therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Now he's not talking about death here, He's talking about slumbering, much like the example in Matthew 25 with the five wise and foolish virgins. To not be caught sleeping, not ready, not prepared. He says, let us not be like that as others are, but let us watch and be sober. And that was one of the instructions that Christ gave the disciples as well. To watch. The matter of watching is to be engaged in terms of when we see things taking place around us, that we should then put together what it is that we should be doing. So as we see the world around us getting more immoral, more ungodly, moving in a very violent and angry direction, 
that should not sweep us along with it, that we should know what to counter that with and where we are to be strengthened. To be sober means to be clear thinking. When you're drunk or under the influence of drugs, you don't think right. Anybody that's been under anesthesia knows that. As you come out of that anesthesia, things are very weird, aren't they? You can repeat yourself a number of times, not realizing you're repeating things. You don't put thoughts together the way you do when you're sober. Being drunk is the same way. You think you're being um, unrecognizable, but your actions from, from others are very evident that you're not clear-headed. And you can be the same way in terms of spiritual thinking. And so he's saying that we should be sober, paying attention, not fuzzy in our thinking, um, but clear-headed. So then verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. That's just part of the way we've designed, been designed, that humanly. I mean, you can have people that work night shifts, you know, overnight, 11 at night to 7 in the morning or whatever. That's very hard. That's a subset of people that can do that and not have it throw them off. I tried that once. I couldn't do it. Uh, God designed us to naturally sleep at night. And so he says, they that are drunk are drunk in the night. You know, after they've generally taken care of the things they have to take care of, um, they engage in this behavior when they know that they're free to do so. Um, but this is where, as I have the, the note to the side there, we take on the armor of God, that we're prepared and aware that we're watching and ready, that we're not caught off guard um, to be doing things from God's perspective, the spiritual calling that he's given us in the appropriate time and in the appropriate way. Verse 8, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Paul repeats this imagery in Ephesians 6 later. We have those other items there in terms of armor that they were very familiar with, with the Roman soldiers who were very effective uh, militarily. So he says we're to be prepared in the right way. We're not children of the night caught off guard. We should be children of the light, ready and um, actively engaged in what God is having us do. So then verse 9, for God has not appointed us to wrath, anger. And that's the one thing that I'm concerned about as God's people move through this in time, is how angry the world is around us. The senseless violence, the rhetoric that is just unnecessary in terms of impugning individuals and maligning individuals. And at times I see that creep into the church with God's people. Um, it's easy to pick up. I know I've done it in the past. You get so angry about something and that anger gets sustained. And unfortunately, it begins to change the way you think. And so he says, we're not to be children of wrath here, that we're not to allow the world to change who we are, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, because this world is not what God has designed us to be a part of. He created us with the desire to have us in his family. And the Greek gods, the Roman gods, the pantheon of the ancient pagan gods, they were all very mercurial, weren't they? They had emotions like human beings. You didn't know if you could count on them. They had the same drama and intrigue within their relationships that humans would have. And there's really not much hope in that, is it? But that's not what God is. God is love. And he has desired to bring us into his family. And to that end, then, we are born for victory, if you will. We're, if we follow God's way of life, I am convinced, based on what I read in God's word, that in his mercy, he will lead us and direct us and make it possible in every way for us to be in his family if we desire to, to be there. Um, that's a much different picture than, than most have of what God is accomplishing. But to obtain salvation by Jesus Christ, verse 10, who died for us, that whether we are alive or asleep, meaning when Christ returns, that we're still physically alive, or if we're waiting in the grave, we should live together with him. That's the end result, isn't it? The end desire. 
Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you also are doing. And so from verse 11 through verse 15, he's encouraging them to continue in the things that they're already doing. We read earlier about the love that they shared with all the brethren in Macedonia. But to continue also in this understanding, this hope of what happens after death, what God is accomplishing and what will happen at Christ's return. So he says, continue to comfort and edify one another as you're already doing. Verse 12, we beseech you, brethren, to know those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. God has established positions of authority within his church. So Paul is also encouraging them to work with those individuals. We know from Matthew 18 that we're not to lord over one another that that service, that authority God gives to various individuals is not for their own glory, but for the glory of the body of Christ. And so he says, work with them, esteem them highly, be at peace amongst yourselves, verse 13. And so we exhort you, brethren, warn those that are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, support the weak, be patient towards all men. And none of that comes naturally in our human nature, does it? There are some people who are more, more dis, um, disposed to that mindset, but there are a lot of people who are not. But as a family, we support one another, don't we? When we get out of line, families should check us and we should be receptive to that. That we've, we've been beaten up, that we can be comforted within the family and that we know that patient, that family will be patient with us. So verse 15, see that none render evil for evil unto any man. And that's especially challenging for us humanly, that when we're wronged, we want our pound of flesh. But as the saying goes, if everything was an eye for an eye, we'd be a world full of blind people. It doesn't serve us, with, especially with God's spirit, to render evil for evil. And we have the example in Jesus Christ. It said he reviled not. <laughs> He didn't even speak back to their, their very awful things they said and did to him. Because that doesn't accomplish what God's will is. That is, it does not accomplish us taking on his spirit. If we start rendering evil for every evil we encounter, we will become evil. Because what you do, you become. He said, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men meaning within the church and outside the church, that no matter who we're interacting with, we, we do it the same way. We reflect God in those things. And so before we leave this section here, let me just turn and read a couple of those verses. So Romans 12 and verse 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome the evil with good. This is why mankind has never been able to bring peace in all the wars that have been fought. You can have peace in terms of absence of war, absence of conflict, absence of destruction, but there is no true peace because we eventually go back to war, don't we? It doesn't fix anything, ultimately. Um, let's see, Galatians 6.10 there, next. So, Galatians 6, verse 10, Paul again writes, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So much like a family, we take care of our family first, and then we can help others. And this is what Paul's talking about in Galatians 6 and verse 10. As we have opportunity, do good to everyone, but don't neglect your family. Do that first, and then as the family's taken care of, that will just naturally extend out. It will, it will be who you are, and it will just be natural in how we interact with people. Verse 16 then, rejoice evermore. You know, the, these final instructions that Paul's giving here in this last part of this letter are points of encouragement to never forget to rejoice. And that's the really sad thing that I've noticed and many others have commented on to me as well leading up to this week as on Thursday this nation somewhat acknowledges thanksgiving to God. It's an afterthought anymore. It's become football watching, it's become family time, not that that's wrong, 
but very few people stop to actually thank God for what he has done for this country specifically, but also in their lives, generally speaking. It's become the opening bell for the Christmas season. We do Halloween as this nation. Once we get past Halloween, it seemed very short order. They were already rolling out all the Christmas stuff, and Thanksgiving becomes an afterthought, if at all. And so he's reminding the church here, rejoice evermore. There's always something to complain about, isn't there? But there's always something to be thankful for as well. The fact that we have life, the fact that we live in this country, even with the problems that it has, there is no other place on the face of this earth I would rather be because there are a lot of really awful places on the face of this earth. And I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about circumstances. God has given us so much in this country. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And what he's referring to here is being in a state of mind of prayer, that we are always having a conversation with God, that we're always asking ourselves, what would God have us do? And in prayer, being focused outside of ourselves. So pray that way always, without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, to go back to my earlier comments, to be grateful to God always. You know, I, I remind myself of this every time I'm on the highway, and it just amazes me how often I see those three-lane exits. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're driving down the highway, and somebody in the high-speed lane, the, the, the middle inside lane, if you will, will suddenly wake up and realize, oh, this is my exit, and they'll go across every lane to get to the exit ramp. Or people that come speeding up behind you, and they hit the brakes, and they get in front of you to get over to the exit lane what they could have just as easily done behind you. I'm always grateful for God's protection. The highways are full of people not paying attention. And this interesting thing I read one time, I don't remember who it was, but one of the drivers in NASCAR and a comment or a question was asked about him about what he thinks, because those cars are traveling close to 200 miles an hour. And the question generally was, you know, do you feel, how safe do you feel out there? And he says, actually, I feel more safe on the racetrack than I do on the highway. Because everybody on the racetrack has their mind focused on the racetrack. <laughs> what their car is doing, where the other drivers are, how fast they're going, you know, all those things they're paying attention to. He says, I drive down the highway. I don't have the same sense of security. They pay, they're paying attention to what they're doing. So there's always something to be thankful for that God has done for us. I also regularly mention the, the, the blessing of the thing that never happened. <laughs> And so even if we don't know something specifically, to ask God for his protection, because I'm convinced we don't know half the story of where God has directed circumstances that we're not in the middle of trouble. It doesn't mean we, we have a life free of any difficulty. What I'm saying is the really awful things of life, with no hope especially. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 19, quench not the spirit. And the spirit is likened in Acts 2. The imagery literally was this fire descending on those people there. The 120 that were gathered. As God's spirit was given to his church, his people. You can quench fire. There are three things needed for fire. You need fuel, you need oxygen, and you need heat. If you have those three things, you'll have a fire. And you can start fire with heat. You can start fire with oxygen, depending on what you're trying to burn. So those things are necessary in the right proportions. And so you can quench fire by reducing the appropriate proportion of any one of those things. If you take the heat away, you'll lose the fire. If you take the fuel away, you'll lose the fire. If you take the oxygen away, you'll lose the fire. And that's the principle of any fire suppression system or killing a fire. Right, so campfire, you want to make sure it's out. You dump water on it. What are you doing? You're taking the heat away. That water now pulls all the heat that it can out of that wood or whatever you're burning. Uh, the foams that they spray are designed to cut off oxygen. So we can quench God's spirit in a similar way if we're not careful. If we're not paying attention to the, the things necessary to maintain God's spirit, because he can give it to us, but we can walk away from it. So verse 20, despise not prophesying. And that word there, 
is less about foretelling future events and more about divine teaching. Don't despise God's word. Don't go off on a tangent. And I've seen too many people do that, unfortunately. They get twisted up in some ancillary teaching and make that the focus of everything. And they end up walking away from the body. Verse 21 then, and I like the way, this is the King James. I like the way the King James puts this. It says, prove all things. The word prove there has the old English expression of if you bought a team of animals, you know, two oxen, uh, two draft horses, whatever it happened to be, you would prove that they're capable animals by hitching them up to a load and seeing what they can do. God's way is no different. We prove God's way of life by testing it. And that's what other translations have there in that verse. Test all things. God is not such a shallow God that he cannot endure the scrutiny of us saying, show me. Now, the caveat is we have to be part of the process. And if we're part of the process and God shows us, then we have a responsibility and an obligation to follow through on it, whether we like it or not. And I've seen people do that. God will test them or allow them to test him, I should say. They have their answer, but they decide, no, in spite of that, I'm still not going to do this. We don't want to be there. Prove all things. And then once we do, hold fast to that which is good. Bring it in, internalize it, keep it close to you. Have that always as a foundation and a marker to make sure that we're not drifting. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now that's not possible, is it? Because people can misinterpret, misconstrue, they can malign character. The word there means any form of evil. We can do that. The best way to stay out of trouble is to not go where trouble is. <laughs> to not give people a reason to think we're doing something we shouldn't be doing. Verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you completely. And I pray to God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about becoming holy as God is, to sanctify you. Sanctify is holiness, something set apart. And so he says, because I want you to have that, I pray to God that every part of your existence becomes like him until Christ returns. The word blameless there has to do with moral character. It does not have to do primarily with not making mistakes. Humanly, we know we will make mistakes, but we can strive and achieve righteous moral character. We saw it accomplished. You go to Hebrews 11 and read those examples. Moses, Moses made mistakes, didn't he? But look how highly God holds a man like Moses up as an example. David, David surely made his share of mistakes. Some of them really, really bad mistakes. But God called him a friend. He's going to be the king over all of the nation of Israel. We could go down the list so we can become morally righteous before God. The word spirit there is pneuma in the Greek, P-N-U-E-M-A. We get pneumatic, pneumonia, those words in our English from that. It literally just means breath. So your whole breath, soul, the Greek word there is suki, which means the self. This is psychology and other related words. Who we are. This is the body. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the self. Um, science can't pin that down. They are slowly coming to the acknowledgement that the brain is not the mind. And that's been an ongoing argument for a lot of decades, that there were scientists that believed that there was something in our brain that made us unique. Whether it was a chemical composition, whether it was some aspect or region of the brain itself, but there was something that made us self-aware like no other creature. We could create the range of emotion, language skills, everything that makes us different. And they're, they're slowly having to acknowledge that there's not. And the reason why they can't find it is its spirit, right? 
there is a spirit in man. God breathed into man the breath of life. That's this suki in the Greek language, the self. God gave that to us. So you have our uh, life itself. We have who we are. And then body simply is soma in the Greek, literally means the body. So everything about our existence is preserved blameless until Christ's return. And so again, he's he's keep coming back to this, the Christ's return because that was on his mind as imminent, fairly imminent. Verse 24, faithful is he who calls you, who will also do it. Meaning if God has called us, then as he says in other places, he is faithful to perform it. That this is not something we have to work up on our own. This is not us having to accomplish all of this on our own willpower, that it is God living in us that allows this to happen, that helps it to happen. So then verse 25, brethren, pray for us. You know, when you look at everything that Paul went through, all that he endured, all the hardships that he went through, all the criticism that he got, all the heresies that he had to address, the the times that he was persecuted by the Jews and by the Greeks or the Romans, he was simply asking to be strengthened. And it's not restricted to someone like Paul. It's that we should all be praying for each other. And the value of that prayer, again, is that God sees us outside of ourselves. It's not just a me, 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 me prayer that we're concerned for the rest of the family. And God sees that and is pleased with that and reacts to that much better than if it's just a selfish prayer. So greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren, that Paul began writing these letters to correct heresy, to teach true doctrine, to encourage the brethren, to strengthen them in that brethren. And in this day and age, they didn't have the, the mass communication means, obviously, we do today. But even writing a letter, if you wanted that letter to be distributed over a wide area, you'd have to have copies made by hand. Somebody would have to handwrite it. So Paul's taking the time to write this. And he says, once you have it, make sure you share it with everybody. Let everybody read what I'm sending here. And so then he concludes with, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So, this is the first, what's called the first epistle of Peter, 1 Thessalonians. He then very shortly follows up with the second letter to the Thessalon Thessalonians, and we'll pick that up next time.